Hello writers, come write with me. My name is Michaela Greenwood. I create worlds for mind adventures. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Write with Michaela. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell so you can go on this journey with me. Today is the first day of season two. Why season two? Well, because we finished reading City of the Ancients on Friday. And this Friday, we will get a new plot to share and write with. Before we dive into today's jargon, let us review everything we talked about in Season 1. On Tuesdays, which were our jargon days, the first Tuesday you, you met me, and then we talked uh, about protagonist and antagonist. Next we talked about plot, setting, genre, mood, theme. Episode 7, we talked about observations and using your senses and if you were sense dominant or what sense dominance you had. And we had a writing prompt. Episode 9, we talked about perspectives. And then we talked about perspectives again recently in episode 37. Episode 11, we talked about my favorite tool, alliteration. And there were a lot of different types of alliteration, but we didn't need to remember all the types. Episode 13 and 15, we talked about emotions and the need to add those to your writings to help your readers connect with your characters. Episode 17, we talked about passive voice and I showed you how to get Microsoft Word to check for passive voice for you. Episode 19, we wrote a peaceful scene. Episode 21, we looked at climax and we touched on synonyms. Episode 23, we looked at idioms and how sometimes using them doesn't make our writing very clear. Episode 25, we had a writing prompt and we, I wrote about two caves. Episode 27, we talked about metaphor and simile. Episode 29, we wrote two scenarios from two different points of views or perspectives. Mine were from a cat lover's perspective and a dog lover's perspective. Episode 31, we talked about personification, hyperbole, metonymy, and irony. Episode 33, we talked about fiction versus nonfiction. Episode 35, we talked about motivation and what would motivate ourselves and our characters. Episode 39, which we already talked about 37. I mentioned it above, so we're not skipping one. Episode 39, we talked about flashback and foreshadow, another tool I enjoy. That was quite a lot of material. So feel free to go back and review any episode that you would like. And I, I tried to label those videos. So if you wanted to learn, learn about plot, you could see the label right there on the video, even if you don't remember the episode. On Fridays, we first received a shared plot and then I read my story. <clears throat> we saw what a rough draft might look like for the bare bones plot I shared or I gave to you. In my story, Kirian, Kirsha, and Kilty went in search of the orb keys after Kilty received a snake bite. We saw some of Kirsha's past and we learned about the dissenters who were the antagonists in that story. Hopefully, as I read the rough draft, you saw the use of some of the jargon that we explored on Tuesdays and, and hopefully you saw places that you could apply that or where I had applied it. And hopefully you enjoyed the story and were able to overlook <clears throat> any of the mistakes or things that I, need, I needed to edit. If you're still writing on that shared plot, then please continue and enjoy writing. When you are ready to exchange your chapters, then email them to writewithmichaela at gmail.com. When I film those or read those for the channel, with permission of course, 
I will label those videos as season one. Now, season two will work the same way as season one. Tuesdays will be writing our literary jargon or writing prompt, which should help us with our writing or in the very least make us more aware of what we have naturally done in our stories. Maybe when we find that we've naturally done it, we can enhance it a little bit or we can, you know, pat ourselves. Oh yeah, I did that. So, uh, that it's just fun stuff. Just have fun. Fridays will be a new shared plot, shared plot two, and then I will read a new story to you. So let's start first. Uh, the, this season's first Tuesday with allegory and archetype. These are some more tools that are fun to play with. Allegory is a narrative or visual representation in which someone can interpret a character, place, or event to represent a hidden, a hidden meaning with moral or political significance. Writers and authors use allegory to illustrate or convey complex ideas and concepts in ways that are comprehensible or striking to their viewers, readers, or listeners. And many allegories use personification of abstract concepts. George Lucas famously described the original trilogy of Star Wars as an allegory of the American Revolution and the Vietnam War, an interpretation that allows the United States to be the Rebel Alliance and the Galactic Empire at the same time. An allegory represents symbolism that creates deeper meaning behind a story that an author tells. Unlike metaphors, which build a one-to-one -one relationship between a symbol and an intended meaning, or intended message, an allegory seeks to create a symbolism that the story hides, and which the allegory causes the audience to think on a significantly deeper level. Animal Farm by George Orwell is a well-known allegory. In this story you see that the government can be corrupt. Orwell uses the dogs to symbolize how governments use military force to intimidate society. Sometimes saying such things outright can be dangerous. So it is up to us writers to represent such topics delicately or artfully. Thus, our readers can think about the symbols and how they apply to their life or life in general. Writers can use allegories to write about present situations or warn about future pending disasters. Yet, at the same time, the reader can relax and enjoy the story on its face value. Idiom alert. C.S. Lewis uses an allegory in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The Lion Aslan represents a Christ character. The, this is a story you can just enjoy it. Read it, enjoy it, without being a Christian or knowing anything about the Bible. But the underlying or hidden message or meaning is Aslan is the rightful ruler of the kingdom of Narnia. Like Christ is the ruler of heaven. And he, the lion, sacrifices his, himself for Edmund, who symbolizes the Judas figure. So you could read the story and not know anything about the Bible, but just enjoy, you know, the three kids going into the wardrobe and exploring the land and... That, you know, seeing the, the lion sacrificed on the stone table and then the battle. You can just enjoy that story. You don't have to know the deeper meaning. But if you're, if you're wanting to explore the deeper meaning, it is there for those that are, are wanting or willing to go deeper. Now, I have given you two examples of allegories for political reasons. 
and one for religious reasons. There are plenty more out there. The point is that neither George Lucas nor George Orwell nor C.S. Lewis came straight out in the story and said what each thing represented. It was just up to us to make those connections. When we use a metaphor, we say something like, life is a highway. So the comparison is right there in plain sight. When we use an allegory, we have a meaning that is much deeper and we hide that meaning. I wrote a poem long ago and the title was, Sometimes We Need the Rain. The meaning in that poem isn't so deep, but when bad things happen to us in life, sometimes we need to cry or relieve our emotional pain. I used the rain and the thunder and the lightning to represent our sadness, our grief, our anger at the wrongs against us. But I didn't name any wrongs. And someone reading the poem would know the different parts of the weather symbolize different things. So oh, that meaning isn't as deep as Star Wars representing the American Revolution or as deep as an allegory needs to be, but it is closer than the metaphor life is a highway because there's that symbolism there. Now let's look at archetype. An archetype is an original model from which someone develops or makes something or an original that someone or something imitates. It's a recurrent symbol or motif in literature, art, or mythology. Archetypes represent innately or distinctly human qualities in a nice package. The most famous example of an archetype is the hero which we discuss as being the possible protagonist of our story. Hero stories have certain elements in common. Heroes generally start out, ordinary circumstances are called to adventure, and in the end they must confront their darkest fear in a conflict that deeply transforms the hero, saves the day, completes the story. Now, when I talked about hero before, it was only in light of the type of protagonist. So I didn't mention him or her confronting their darkest fear. I didn't mention a conflict that deeply transforms the hero. And I wouldn't consider Kirsha a hero in that sense. But certainly she had to face some deep set fears. And as the story progressed, she learned some of her fears weren't against normal males, but against the dissenters. Finally, in the story, she had to face and fight the dissenters. And she had to fight them beside people that she loved and wanted to protect. In the city of the ancients, the big transformation of the story happened with the restoration of the city. But certainly, Kirsha transformed along you know, she transports some along the entire journey. Now, as far as archetypes go, there are tw 12 brand arch archetypes according to Jung. Okay, so his are the innocent, the orphan, the hero, the outlaw, the explorer, the creator, the ruler, the magician, the lover, the caregiver, the jester, and the sage. And he has them under four main archetypes, like the persona, the shadow, the anima, or animus, and the self. And Jung viewed the 12 archetypes under the umbrella of the four major characteristics of the collective conscious, or the collective unconscious, sorry. Uh, we're not going to go into any of the four major characteristics but we're going to take a brief look at the 12 from Jung. Now, if, if you were reading books, there's a ton of books. But there's a book called Archetypes by Carolyn Miss. And she describes 10 of the archetypes in her book. And she has different titles for some of these things. But if you read some of what she says, it's going to fall in with some of the definitions we give here today. But in the back of her book, she lists 21 archetypes. 
So I don't want you worrying about which archetype or whatever, but just listen to some of the definitions and that might help you. Okay, so Google has the definitions of Jung's 12. And when you're trying to define a character's perspective, this is what I was trying to say just a second ago, these will help you. Also, you will probably find yourself in one or more of these. There are whole books and classes about this. We're just going to go over the definitions a little bit here. Okay? So, the innocent seems to have read and absorbed every self-help book in the world. They're optimistic and always searching for happiness. The innocent sees the good in everything. They want to feel well-adjusted to the world around them. The innocent also wants to please others and feel like they belong. Do you know someone like this? Number two, the orphan archetype walks around with open wounds. They feel betrayed and disappointed. They want other people to take charge of their life. And when no one does, they feel disappointed. They tend to spend time with people who feel just like them. The orphan often plays the victim. They pretend to be innocent, but the orphan has a cynical side and manipulative talent. Do you know someone like this? The axis of a hero's life is power. The hero has an uncommon vitality and resistance that they use to fight for power or honor. They'll do anything to avoid losing. In fact, they don't lose because they never give up. The hero can be overly ambitious and controlling. Do you know someone like this? The outlaw or rebel is a transgressor. They provoke people and don't care at all about other people's opinions. As a result, they like going against the grain or, and they like thinking for themselves. They don't like anyone to pressure or influence them. The negative side to the rebel or outlaw archetype is they can become self-destructive. Do you know someone like this? The explorer is a bold traveler. They set out with it without a clear path. And they're always open to novelty and adventure. The explorer has a deep love of discovering new places and new things about themselves even. The downside of the explorer archetype is that they're always searching for perfection. And they're never satisfied. Do you know someone like this? The Creator has a profound desire for freedom because they love novelty. They love to transform things in order to make something completely new. The Creator is clever, nonconformist, and self-sufficient. They're imaginative and good-humored. However, they can also be inconsistent and spend more time thinking than actually doing. Do you know someone like this? The ruler is a classic leader. They believe they should be the one to bring order to any situation. The ruler is stable and strives for excellence and wants everyone to follow their lead. They tend to have plenty of reasons why everyone should listen to them. This is one of the archetypes related to power, as defined by Jung. Note that the ruler, in their desire to impose their will on others, can easily become a tyrant. Do you know someone like this? The magician is a great revolutionary. They regenerate and renew, not just for themselves, 
but for others as well. They're constantly growing and transforming. The negative side of magician archetype is that their mood can be contagious. They sometimes turn positive events into negative ones. Do you know someone like this? Excuse me just a second. <laughs> okay. The lover is all heart and sensitivity. They love, love, and love to lavish it on other people. Their greatest happiness is feeling loved. They enjoy everything that's pleasing to the senses. They value beauty in every sense of the word. And they value beauty above all. Do you know someone like this? The caregiver feels stronger than other people feel. They feel stronger. Consequently, they offer a maternal protection to those around them. They want to protect people from harm and try to prevent any danger or risk from threatening other people's happiness. In extreme cases, the caregiver turns and to a martyr who constantly reminds everyone of their sacrifices. Do you know someone like this? The jester likes to laugh, even at themselves. They don't wear any masks, and they tend to break down other people's walls. They never take themselves seriously, because their goal is to enjoy life. Now, the negative side of the jester is they can be lewd, lazy, and greedy. Do you know someone like this? The sage is a free thinker. Their intellect and knowledge are their reason for living, their, their essence. They seek to understand the world and their being by using their intelligence and analytical skills. They always have a fact, a quote, or a larger logical argument on the tip of their tongue. Do you know someone like this? Now these are brief definitions uh, and they are a generalized overview and each type has positive attributes or, and negative attributes. Like I said earlier, there, there are books and classes and personality tests, etc., 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 to figure out which archetype you are or most like. Also, above, I mentioned a shadow umbrella. I haven't done the research on umbrellas, but I understand the shadow is part of yourself that you repress for whatever reason. You don't think society would allow it or you don't want to be embarrassed or what you repress this. So, inside of you, there may be a characteristic of an archetype or characteristics of an archetype that, that don't shine through, okay? Like I said, I haven't done the research, and I'm certainly not asking you to do so. I just want you to be aware that there are overall character types. The characters in your stories will automatically fall into one of the 12 types, according to you. And if you read another book, it'll be a different type. But some things like, I think, in Carolyn Miss, she has the, the executive instead of the ruler. So you can kind of see the, the similarities. So the, like I said, this is an overall type, and you, your characters may may or may not have characteristics of the other 11 types. They be one dominant and then the other 11 they might have pieces of. Or they may have the negative aspects of the arch type. We discussed motivation. So certainly the 12 types would have a different motive or motivation. Leave a comment below on which type you see in yourself based on these brief definitions. From these uh, brief definitions, I will say I am like the sage. Although I don't always have a fact, a quote, or large logical argument on the tip of my tongue. I'm also like the creator. Although I'm not always good humored. 
And finally, from our short definitions today, I am like the magician. It is okay if you see several definitions here for yourself. We're not studying Jung or personality type. We're just glancing at this to help us build our characters in our stories. And if we're aware of these characteristics in ourselves, then it would be easier for us to apply those characteristics to the characters that we create in our stories. And when you leave comments, don't, don't be negative about somebody else because there are positive attributes of these characters and there are negative attributes to these characters. So somebody may see characteristics and they may say, oh, I'm like the, this. And you may have somebody that falls into that characteristic in your life that has the negative aspects while this person is focusing on the positive. So no criticisms or no shaming or anything. We are who we are. And, and the more we realize that, the easier it is for us to create our characters and, and have our characters grow and keep them within the character that we've defined for them to be also because we don't want them popping back and forth necessarily. Uh, but they, you know, they can have aspects from the different ones, but they wouldn't go from being fully one to being fully a different one. That those other characteristics would have to be present uh, along the journey. Okay, writers, there is no writing assignment today, but I've given you a lot to think about, including all of season one jargon and then today's uh, definitions. So have fun with it. Leave a comment on which archetype you want to have as a character in your story or stories or which ones you have used for your three friends in our shared plot. Like I said, you may not have known that these character types or archetypes and you may have just started writing your story, but now you go back and say, oh yeah, that character is just like this. So it, it's something that we do without having to think about it or without jargon and definitions. So um, we're just learning the stuff so that we can know what we did and have a little bit more forethought about using it. Join me Friday for story time. I will read our new plot, Shared Plot 2. And the following Friday, we will start reading the new story, Tahia. Join me Tuesday for some more jargon or writing prompt. Or I might talk about November, where we have the NaNoWriMo contest that we can join. If you have a suggestion on what I should do, then leave that in the comments. Uh, writers may send their chapters for the chapter exchange to writewithmckella at gmail.com. In between days, you can visit my website at www.bymckella.com where you will find fictional character biographies. Thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate your participation. If you know someone who would like this video, then please share it with them. This is McKella with Write with McKella. Bye for now.